breaking conformity and you know going moving out of mainstream right so in some ways this talk is also about uh, at index what uh, whatever we have tried to do to break out of mainstream in terms of uh, uh, large implementing a large scale data processing uh, system pipeline uh, we started with the a few tried and tested way of doing things and we failed and then uh, we applied uh, tried applying at least the functional programming principles and to a large extent it was very successful for us um, and then we, we, we scaled this platform using Hadoop. So those are the three major themes of my talk. Talk about what data uh, systems are like, what challenges we face, what principles, functional programming principles we can apply to tackle those challenges and how do you scale them. So that's what this talk is going to be. Okay, uh, I'll begin with what a data pipeline actually is because a lot of us come from uh, uh, like even my own background before joining Index was from uh, typical web facing uh, consumer apps and so on where uh, you, you typically have one database. It's mostly, it's mostly about people, uh, people's information records, transactional nature. Uh, but when you actually deal with a data pipeline, uh, the processing systems are a little different. So typically you have, you have a, this, this is your data pipeline. You have raw data that comes into your system, this blue guy there. And then it, it basically gets forked and then either serially processed or parallelly processed through all these subsystems. And each of these subsy subsystems can actually use some metadata from outside. So all this is massaged and then it finally gets joined and then you have this structured data, right? So if you look at our pipeline, our own pipeline at Index, uh, what we offer is product intelligence uh, solutions to our customers. So what that means uh, is uh, you have products being sold by brands and retailers. We go crawl them and then so you end up with HTML pages that look like this, product pages, right? Samsung, Galaxy, S5. Fairly unstructured, you can call it semi-structured because it's somewhat HTML, but uh, people, we realize they use horrible HTML, so it's almost unstructured data. Um, so we put it through like multiple systems, just like, just like this kind of, uh, 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 this diagram here. We put it through multiple systems, not necessarily sequentially, and then at the, right at the end of it, you're going to have this uh, structured product information like, okay, this is actually a title and this is a prize and it's actually a mobile phone and so on. So, so a very quick introduction, this is what a data system looks like and I'm gonna use this as an example to uh, move forward. Let's just begin first with uh, some of the challenges you face uh, when you have to build a system like this, right? Uh, first thing is the data is gonna change continuously. Uh, this can appear in two forms. One, if you, are, if you are doing crawling, for example, like what we do, as you crawl and more and more pages, as you discover more pages, you have a constant stream of data that enters your system, right? And um, new data could come and existing data when they are processed by these systems. If one system, let's say you roll out an algorithm update, let's say you are, you are classifying this page as a shoe or a mobile phone or whatever, right? So if there is a classification change, logic change that happens in your algorithm, all the downstream systems that depend on this data needs to reprocess it. So, there's always data that's flowing through the system, right? It's a never ending thing, it goes 24 seven. And since, as we saw in the diagram, uh, the data is going to be touched by multiple systems, uh, you always have to join and fork and, and you know, uh, stitch the data together, together at various parts to actually come up with the final, final output, whatever that you want. So this whole orchestration and stitching data together, that's, that's another challenge. And uh, with data, the thing is, uh, you don't have any control over what the sites can uh, throw at you. You will think that you are, you are actually crawling a HTML page, you will end up with some zip file or a exe file or God knows what. Uh, so, so recovering from such bad data uh, and then, uh, and then you, 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 will have to, you will have to basically rerun your pipeline, ignore the bad data, move on, things like that. How, do you, how nimble are you, at, uh, are you at rerunning these things? Because you have gonna, you're gonna have a constant stream of data that's flowing in. So, Recovery is very tricky in that sense. Um, I can't emphasize how important metrics and aggregations are because when you have millions of records flowing through the system, this is the only way you know, okay, something is going wrong, right? You, you should, you, and many of the metrics are in terms of aggregation. So if, if I have, if I'm crawling 100 stores and in each store I know that I have uh, uh, 10, 10 products or 15,000 products, 20,000 products and so on, this aggregation, the counts in each of the store is going to help me figure out, okay, tomorrow, this store, I'm generally expecting it to have 10,000 products. Today, it's having only 1,000. Something happened, right? So this metrics and this aggregation needs to be implemented at every single system and, and also as a system as a whole. 
right? So these are some of the challenges. There are many more. I'm going to, I'm going to take these four things, and then uh, and then we'll see how uh, like taking some leaf out of the functional programming world. How 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 can how we can um, address these. Uh, scale, I thought, deserved a, a separate slide because uh, whatever we do, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we are dealing at uh, like a lot of data. At least uh, this is what we deal with at Index. We get four, four terabytes of uh, fresh data in every day, and then we have about 450 million product URLs. So uh, there are systems which which are machine learning dependent and so on. So the scale is scale becomes very important as as, as we look at this whole whole thing. Okay, so here's our first mainstream attempt uh, at building this. A uh, lot of us came from, as I said, uh, consumer-facing web app background. So we thought, okay, you just have a database, shared mutable state, right? This is the row that it's going to be processed. So this is like a URL of a page, right? This is what is going to be processed by all your systems. Let's give it one column for each uh, one, one system or one component. So uh, component one, you know, goes and crawls, puts it here, maybe, for example, then component two reads the HTML, processes it, maybe extracts some semi-structured data from that, puts it here, component three reads, and so on. So so this this was like the most simplest thing we, that we started with, right? Um, obviously, things didn't go well, because um, we faced multiple issues. Most of it could be traced back to this fact that uh, given any row, right, any cell, the values are constantly mutating because when you look at when you look at a system, when you when you look at these components, each component will have its own lifetime. You can have component one. Let's take these to be like let's say bulk jobs that you run on your data, right? So this could run maybe every one hour uh, because uh, this component is something that deals with the price and price changes very frequently. So we need to run it frequently. Uh, maybe this doesn't change very often, right? Like product attributes don't change often. Uh, a, a title is going to be the same title, right? So so this maybe system moves slowly. So and then what happens is in a given row, you have so many cells. In each cell, you're going to have each system writing at different, pay, pay, uh, different speeds. Um, this causes like a huge pain point when something goes wrong because you have no idea how a value reached there. Like you see a value in one cell, which is 200. You don't know how it, ha you don't know this exact sequence of step that it arrived for that, for, to, to reach that value of 200. So error recovery is also very painful because you have one big database. It's Right, writes are happening cons 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 consistently, and reads are also happening. So, how do you like take snapshots? How do you back this up? How do you scale it? it it's, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge nightmare. So, mainstream sucks. So, this was our uh, mainstream approach. How we would have, how, how we would have thought about implementing this whole whole thing. Uh, so, we we went back and we thought, okay, this sounds very sim uh, familiar, right? I mean, it's almost like you have a program with shared mutable state, a class with all these variables all over the place, and you're trying to do concurrency or multi-threading on top of that. that that's how it, this whole thing looks like. So we thought, maybe, you know what, there should be a way to uh, tackle these problems and, you know, kind of build a system that's centered around uh, functional programming pr principles. So when you look at some of the principles that, that we know, and uh, I I'm sure like a lot of us, uh, see the value in these things, uh, immutability, and containing side effects, pure functions, idempotence, monads, monad, monoids, right? So can we see whether we can apply these things uh, to bring some sanity and order to our uh, system? So that was, that was the idea that we began with. The very first thing we thought was we should embrace immutability, right? Because as I said earlier, when you see a value 100, you need to know how it became 100, because that's the only way you can find out if something goes wrong. Oh, actually, you know what? Component A did this, component B did this, and there's actually an error there. So that's, that's why this 100 came into picture. Uh, when you have a shared mutable a database, which is just like a cell, and you just update its value or delete its value, right? You lose a lot of history behind it, right? Every update and delete statement actually tells you a history behind, behind what happened. So we thought we should never lose data. We should, although you, although you can do updates on deletes, but the fact that you did updates on deletes should not be lost, right? So that was the very first uh, thing that we realized we should be doing. So uh, we thought of uh, just using uh, the operations that we do on the uh, uh, data as just just as log, log events on a log, right? So you have uh, you have every time an update happens on a row, we say okay, this is updated. Uh, the old value was this, new value was this, and so on. You just have this uh, consecutive se sequence of uh, uh, events that's thrown into your log file. Uh, what this also means is we are kind of separating, uh, instead of having one big database 
where read and write happens at the same time. Uh, we have one dedicated up and only write store where only writes happen, right? And then whenever you want to read from this, you will have to do some kind of reconciliation to form this view here, okay? So you can use a, a, like a Kafka-like kind of queue here because it's, it gives you, it really scales well. In, in our case, we just de decided to go with uh, HDFS, just writing to the file system, up and, up and only files, right? So, so the, the idea was, okay, let's have two different views. Uh, this, is, this is primarily concerned with high throughput writes. This is primarily concerned with reads. And you need to do something here to reconcile these events to form your views. Okay, uh, stop me if I'm going fast or something. Feel free to, or if you have questions. Were, were there any transaction requirements here? So uh, we don't really, uh, ours is a very, uh, 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 since we deal with uh, large amounts of data and it's not really customer related or financial related, we didn't really have any straight transaction requirements. We, we are fine with eventual consistency and so on. So, so let's look at how we will do the reconciliation, right? So um, let's say you, at time T1, you had a job, a bulk job that ran on your data. It read all your data and put some value, uh, values for each row in the, ta in the, in the data, right? And, and uh, let's say that failed. The failure could mean maybe because there was a bug in the code, uh, you wrote the same value for all the rows, maybe the code actually didn't run or maybe it failed halfway through, uh, that's fine. So, uh, so what do you do? You rerun the job on the same data one more time. So if in the, in the mainstream or a traditional uh, database world, you will have uh, for the TK, you're going to have V1, which is the wrong value, and then that's corrected by the run, uh, the job two. You, you will just replace that value with V2, that's it. So that's how the old model used to work. Uh, how do you do it if you are looking at only up and only stores? You, you don't get random updates, you don't get random writes to specific uh, uh, rows in your database. So this is what you do, you, you run a job, Right, this is that reconciliation step I was talking about. So you run a job, uh, every record is going to have an ID, right? In our case, we crawl product pages. So the URL is the unique identifier for us. So we, we group it by the ID. So if you had run your job multiple times, for example, let's say you ran your job two times, you're going to get two records. The du duplicates is going to be a list and it's going to have two records, right, of, with the same ID. So you can apply a function here that fix the latest because in this case, we want the latest guy. But the cool thing is, since we are actually having the entire history of your product, re product records or your records, you can actually do this read time resolution in multiple ways. Uh, for example, you don't necessarily need to pick the latest. Maybe uh, you, you want to pick uh, field one and two from the latest run, and then maybe field three and four from the previous run, that's possible. So this read time resolution gives you a lot of flexibility uh, in that way, because you have a complete history of what happened to your record, right, along the way. There are other also, there are also other benefits of uh, uh, using this up and only model and creating, uh, separating your writes and reads. Um, item potence, you can run the same operation multiple times, uh, and uh, based on your read uh, logic, it, it, will, it will give you the same output over and over again. And the up and only storage uh, is also very reliable and scales well. Uh, the primary reason for that is if you use a, a random write store, like take MySQL or we were using HBase. Uh, what happens is, is there's a lot of data, even the, the implementation details vary, but generally the data gets write, written to your, uh, to your memory and then there is a, a read, lo a read a write log that, that gets written and then this gets merged and then your indexes needs to be updated. There is a lot of writes, there's a lot of complexity around maintaining a random write store. Uh, when you're using up and only storage, none of this, uh, none of this applies, so it's really it's easy to scale. And as I said, you can use Kafka or just HDFS uh, files. You can just write to them. And uh, this actually, this whole thing forms the basis of uh, this phrase, uh, this uh, uh, term called Lambda architecture. Uh, this was coined by uh, Nathan Maas uh, of, uh, uh, of Twitter. So yeah, we actually use, I'm not going to go in too much details into this, but we actually use Lambda architecture at Index. Uh, if you are interested, you can. Uh, see our engineering blog. Uh, we talk about uh, there is multi a multi-part series about how we implement uh, some of the things that I just touched upon right now. Okay, let's move on. So we spoke about immutability. Now uh, le let's talk about a side effect containment. Right now, now you have a system that only does writes in app and only fashion. There is no random reads. I mean, there is no random writes. Reads are kind of uh, segmented away. Now, uh, but that doesn't mean that 
you're done because uh, you want to treat every every component or every system the the initial diagram I showed every circle there as a pure function so what 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 does it mean you 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 give it you give it an input and it gives you output there is no state anywhere outside it doesn't one component doesn't inadvertently change the story for another component so you you want to uh, in pseudo code or in functional pseudo code if, if I have uh, you can actually imagine the transformation of your data like this. So I have HTML pages, uh, right? I get a HTML page, I parse it, I get some parsed record, for example. Then I classify it and so on. So I'm able to ch change this data transformations uh, in, this, in this manner. This is, this, this, is what, this is what I want to do because each, each, func each function here can be a component. This could be a component that parses pages, this could be a component that classifies pages and so on. You can, you can change things this way. This is, this is a very easy, uh, pseudo code form of uh, looking at your data pipeline. Um, in fact, if you want to look at the uh, a function signature or something of that, it looks like this, right? You have a uh, you have a collection of type M uh, of uh, products uh, uh, of type T, and then you are actually transforming T to you. In this case, uh, the HTML the HTML page becomes a past record and so on. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the the container M remains as it is. So from M of T, it becomes M of you. Uh, can anybody tell? Sorry. Uh, components and functions are they the same, or is there a difference? So, so I'm trying to I'm trying to link them together. So I'm I'm saying that uh, you should treat a component, uh, some component, like a pure function in the sense, drawing inspiration from from how you have how your pure function uh, behaves, right? It has a very clear contract input. It has a very clear contract output. That's it. So, like if you were to compose different functions, right? Yes, each activity. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And and so, can anyone say what this? Yeah, right. So this is uh, this is this is nothing but a monad. I'm I'm not going to explain uh, or dive into monads or uh, the, uh, the the definition and the monadic rules and so on because I think uh, uh, that's going to take some time. But I'm going to explain uh, for uh, even for some some of us like myself, it was uh, it was a very new thing when when, when I learned it. So I'm going to explain how. Monad is use, monad is useful, right? Uh, so uh, this very quick explanation. Uh, uh, monad allows you to express a series of uh, transformations or a sequence of operations on your data, right? Such that you actually have a data type that keeps changing in a, every a, that can potentially change after every operation. So uh, data type T becomes U here and then it becomes S. But if you look at it as a whole, it is the, it is being boxed by this uh, monad type M. Right, it's, it's a monad. The same monad is is preserved uh, as the data inside gets transformed. So, so if th this this is a way of looking at it as a monad, why 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 is it useful, right? Why is it useful? Is because uh, I will also touch upon this subject later on. But uh, it gives you a general abstraction to look at your whole uh, system, right? So uh, you your monad has certain properties, and and if you if you think of your system. Like this, it gives you a very nice way, nice abstraction, especially those of us who have, uh, uh, who come from the functional world to look at your system, system this way. And uh, as I mentioned before, scale is a really important factor about this whole thing. So far, we've been touching on, okay, we can, we can take principles from functional programming, all that is fine. So how do you deal with scale and how do you deal with this orchestration that I spoke about, right? Reading from multiple things, forking, joining, all these different, uh, different things uh, of data. So this is a uh, this is a quote that says uh, uh, Hadoop is the uh, uh, MapReduce is the enterprise Java beams of our time. Um, in many ways, if you look at uh, scaling your platform data platform, I think Hadoop is definitely the best uh, option available to do that today. It, it, uh, it's been it's proven to work at big companies and and it, it's really good. But the the problem is the raw MapReduce APIs uh, that Hadoop gives you. Uh, let's say you want to uh, sequence these uh, various jobs as form of MapReduce jobs is re really, really ugly. Uh, when I mean by ugly, uh, they, they are very low level, right? They, it's, it's, it's good in the sense they are very flexible, you can do a lot of things, but it's not very intuitive. It's not, you definitely can't easily express your algorithm in terms of uh, MapReduce. MapReduce, okay, every time you, you come up with algorithm, now you have to like go and think, okay, how is this going to fit into the MapReduce model? Is this is this operation going to be a map, and and is this going to be a reduce? What should I emit from the mapper in the reducer? How should I group by what key? And you know, this it's not a very natural way to do it. E even though Hadoop is, uh, in, in my hope, opinion, is the best uh, platform available for like data crunching at a uh, large scale, right? 
So definitely we didn't want to use raw MapReduce APIs. That means you will have to build some abstractions. Why do that when you already have cascading? Um, cascading is a Java API um, on top of this um, MapReduce APIs that allows you to forget about MapReduce and think about data flows. So what does it mean? Uh, they have borrowed a lot of concepts from the world of plumbing. So, so, yeah, so, so you have tap. The tap is tap can be either a source or a sink, right? A source is some source is something that you read from, uh, like your input file is a source, and sync is something that you write to, right? Easy. So you you read from a source and you write to a sync, and and you can read from a text file, for example, and write to a sequence file. You can read from a CSV, write to a CSV. All this abstracted away from you, and. Um, and once you read from a source, you're going to get a pipe. So this pipe represents a immutable stream of data. So if you're reading, let's say, a TSV file, uh, this pipe is going to contain lines for you, right? Every 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 record in every record in that pipe is going to have a, a line, and then you can apply some map operations on it. You can filter it. A map will mean, okay, I'm getting a number one. I'm going to multiply it by two. That's a map. Uh, I'm getting a number one. I'm going to like not let it go through because it's not divisible by two, that's a filter. You can specify functions that will either let the pipe to transform the data that flows through it, or you can let it filter the data that flows through it. And, uh, and then you can uh, plug in these aggregators, um, stuff like you have thousand, you're reading thousand uh, pro, uh, records from a file, thousand lines from a TSV file. Uh, I, I don't really need to know uh, what are each lines, I just want to know that there are thousand lines in that file. So that's an aggregator count aggregator, for example, that you can plug in. So you, if you notice here, right, um, apart from this map, which is more like the functional map, uh, there is no map reduce at all here. You, 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 you don't have to think about map reduce. You just think in terms of data flows. I have a pipe of data. I'm going to map it. I'm going to filter it. I'm going to fork it. I'm going to join it. Things like that. And and cascading takes care of actually creating the map reduce jobs under the hood. Uh, we have had uh, some 20 lines of code producing like 13, 14 MapReduce jobs uh, in the past. So, sorry about that. Right. So, this is this is how you do a word count in uh, cascading. Um, so, so you define a source, which is a tap. Uh, you're reading from your input path, and then you have a sync, right? And then and then you you are initiating a new pipe and saying, I need I want a pipe called word count. And uh, and then and then you you and and then these are the operations that you do on a pipe. I'm I'm doing a, I'm splitting the I'm I'm splitting the uh, line into different words, and then and then I'm going to group grouping on the word, and then I'm going to aggregate on the on the number of words, and then this is how you assemble a pipe. So so again, no map, no reduce, no fancy terms. It's all very logical chunks how you will deal with data. That, that that's it. Uh, but we still weren't happy with this because. Um, this is still quite verbose, right? And and you are doing all this stuff like reassigning uh, all this mutation and, and, and things like that. I mean, it still reads like, doesn't look functional enough to us. So we thought there must be a better way to do it, right? So so scalding is a, it's a wrapper on top of cascading. So this is how it fits. You have raw Hadoop APIs. You have cascading, which gives you, which gives you stuff like this, like high level uh, abstractions. And then you have, Scalding, which which gives you a Scala API on top of the uh, cascading APIs, um, and Scalding is not the only tool. You also have other things like Scooby, uh, but we chose Scalding because Twitter uses them heavily. There's a huge community around that, and uh, so let's look at the same word count example in Scalding. Four lines. So, in fact, if I just ask you to just squint at it for one second and close it, you will say that this is not even a MapReduce code. You're probably going to say it's a Scala code. Those of you who are familiar with Scala. Because this almost looks exactly like how you will do it in Scala. You read from an input, you flat map, convert the line to a list of words, and then you're grouping it by a word, and then you're finding the site size, and then you're writing it out to an output. That's that's about it. It's four lines. Um, we use Scaling very very heavily. We have hundreds of jobs that we run every day. Uh, so it has become some, some some kind of a SQL replacement for us. So. Uh, when 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 you used to say okay I want to know what uh, some some analytics requirement something I'm I'll, I'll be doing select star from in the uh, in, uh, usually if you have a, a SQL database what we do is we just write a four line five line scalding job we run it it's going to give you the data out 
right? So that, that it's, it's really powerful because it really empowers you to run these ad hoc queries. Otherwise, you'll end up writing this or worse, this kind of code for each of your job, and there's going to be a lot of boilerplate around. Yeah. Uh, when you're dealing with data, your your data reading and writing is going to take most time. Network latency and I/O is going to take most most of the time. Uh, um, the thing you need to be slightly worried about is, um, will this be transformed into a single MapReduce job? In, if you write it in Hadoop, write MapReduce, you can write it in a single MapReduce job. If, but if scaling is not good, it could potentially be not very optimal. It can spawn two, three jobs. But from our experience, we have never seen that happen. It's really good. They have a very good flow planner, which, which clearly says that, OK, if this is the code, minimum as, as, as if you will write it by hand, they will generate that kind of uh, map, map, number of MapReduce programs. So the, yeah. Sorry. Uh, we don't because we do, you don't think about the raw MapReduce jobs at all. You you don't because as I said we had a, uh, as I said we had like a 20 line program that that actually uh, spins up 13 MapReduce jobs because of course we read from multiple sources we join we do like okay so we do this kind of thing we, we read from one pipe and then we join it with another pipe and on the same key. Right, so you have some, let's say you have some uh, records with uh, field A to B, A to E, and then you have another uh, input source with field F to Z or something like that, and you want to combine this, you can do this, this kind of high level abstraction. Writing a join in MapReduce is really, really painful. And we have jobs that do uh, four or five joins and the code is only like uh, eight to 10 lines. So, so, and we have not seen any uh, noticeable performance because we did start with raw map reduce and then we moved to scaling. It was a uh, it was an evolution, so we really didn't feel the pinch. Right, scaling uses cascading and cascading and cascading at the at the at the at the end it generates us, generates the actual Hadoop jobs for you. Right, so. Uh, so Spark is mostly. Um, uh, we also have a spa, uh, We also have some uh, some components in our uh, system uh, in our data science platform, which actually they use Spark for it. Uh, Spark is mostly for in-memory crunching. Uh, for example, if you have a group by, let's say you have a group by operation on a on a fee. Uh, let's say you want to group by on a store, right? For example, and and in our in our system, for example, we, Amazon has millions of uh, pro, uh, URLs in a given in its store. So in, if you try to do that in Spark today, it will, you will run out of memory because at least as of now, there's a Jira for, for them to address it, but as, at least as of now, you can't do a group by on a very large set of, it needs to fit in memory. Spark is very useful when your data set fits in memory and you want to do iterative uh, things like in machine learning, you want to do run the same algo multiple times. That's very useful uh, because um, I'm not going to go too much into that, but uh, Scalding, it's still disk, it's still Hadoop, it's slow, but the data need not fit in memory. That's the flexibility that you get. Okay. Okay. So I, I spoke about uh, how important metrics and aggregations are because um, this is like your heartbeat. Uh, you, you kind of monitor it and you see that okay, uh, uh, am, I, am I doing well? So in our in uh, in, in our uh, for example in our system we have multiple stores and uh, this is one aggregation that we do on for every store we count the number of products that uh, we have on the, in that store. Let's say uh, suddenly this count drops. We are expecting this to be like 8 million, and then it's only 200,000. We know that something went wrong. Either uh, we didn't crawl properly, or some uh, some system some system just ate up the files, uh, ate up the records, or something like that. So, so this metrics and aggregations are very very useful. Uh, for example, let's take count. Right, you want to count records, and you're no longer your data is just doesn't fit in one machine. It fits in multiple machines. Uh, so how do you do a aggregation over multiple machines? You do the local aggregations, count one, count two, count three, and then you only send the counts, these three values, to a central node, and then you, and then you sum, sum them up. Uh, so you don't have to actually send all the data to a single node to count. You can actually do this local aggregation uh, and count. And count is not the only kind of aggregations you do. You you do max, you will do min. Uh, max and min are useful for doing threshold detection. Are you going? Very high. Uh, you you can do outlier detection. For example, there are uh, e-commerce sites uh, that uh, accidentally have products with 20 million, uh, 20 million as the price, right? Um, so uh, you want to remove that from your system, but because you are showing analytics to your customer, that will kind of your average will now be very very high. 
So uh, you can do, so you, you need, you need, you, can, you need max and min, and you want to do sum and, and, and things like that. If you want to do average, you need to, you need to do sum. Um, so if you look at about parallelizing this aggregation operations, right, we can only do it if, if that, that particular operation satisfies these three, these three properties. Uh, the, uh, first of all, the operation needs to be associative. That means a, in a dot b dot c should be the same as a dot b dot c, right? So because you don't know in which order they are going to be uh, summed up in which node, so the operation needs to be associative. Um, and then the re result should belong to the same, uh, same set. You add two integers, you need to get an integer. And, and, and identity element is important. For example, if you're doing counts, let's say one node did not even have that thing that you're counting, then you have to send zero, right? You say add a zero with some number, it's going to give you zero. In this case, for count, zero is your identity element. So can someone think of a data structure that satisfies these properties? Sorry? Right, so again, this ties back to, to a monoid. This is, this is nothing but a monoid. monoid um, monoid actually has these three properties which we spoke about, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and to explain what a monoid is, monoid gives you like a view around your data. So let's say your data is X and Y. Uh, a monoid is this pink circle around it. It's a view on the data. So a max or a min or a count or a sum is a view, right? Because you're finding the maximum representation of that thing. So that's a, a, of the set, which is like a view on your data. So if you can come up with an operation, right, that satisfies these three properties, on this view, then that view qualifies to be a monoid. So uh, we spoke about max, min, and sum. Those are all monoids because they, 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 they are actually views, and then there are operations on them that satisfy these properties. And um, more monoids, this is a monoid, uh, because when you add two elements, uh, when you add two lists, the elements belong to the individual list, uh, and, 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 and the identity element is a nil. So you can add a nil with any list, it's going to get itself. And then similarly for set set also. So, um, so why are, but so why are monoids important? Just like how I explain why monoids are useful, right? Why are monoids important? Because all I need to ask is, how do I represent this computation as a monoid? That's all I need to do. So I want to do some aggregation. I want to parallelize it. Uh, and I don't need to go to my colleague and explain to him, hey, I want to do this, that, and all that. I just need to tell him, hey, how do I represent this as a monoid? It's a, like, you form your own lingo, right? And, 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 and if, if, if you can't represent that a computation as a monoid, it means you cannot, you cannot parallelize it. And, and that, that's one cool thing about having that abstraction in place. And um, if you're using Scalding, you can easily define a monoid like this and plug it in. So, so what, what usually happens in a, uh, in, a, in a company is you are going to have different teams that are working on the same set of problems. For example, in my, in my, uh, in my system, I have a need to do a max. In, in uh, maybe the, the, uh, the system uh, next to me, they also have a need to do a max. If you don't have this common contract or a common way to look at your aggregations using monoids, I'm going to write my own max function. He's going to write his own max uh, function, and, and, and the code gets duplicated and so on. If, if you think in terms of monoids, uh, Scalding already gives you a set of monoids, and then you can also define, define your monoid using, uh, using this library called AlgeBird, which, which is what Scalding uses. So you can, for example, define a set monoid. You just need to define two operations on it. You define the identity element, and you define the actual operation that you need. And, and, then, you, and, then, you, and then you can plug it in, and that's it. Uh, once it's in your standard library, anybody who wants to do a, a, a set in, in future can just use it. You're not going to have code duplications, and it gives you a very nice abstraction. Of course, there are always ex exceptions. Not every computation can fit in as a monoid. For example, if you want to do a median of your data, uh, there's no easy way to do it. You can't uh, parallelize it. You need to bring the data to a single machine and, and then find the median. There's, there's no way. But uh, at least from, uh, from our experience, there is, these are very rare. I, I don't remember when was the last time somebody ever asked me what's the median of this data set. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't apply to us. Maybe the situation is different for you. But uh, there are, of course, exceptions. In those cases, you don't have, you don't have a choice. So I want to summarize uh, uh, whatever, uh, whatever things that we have gone through. Um, the first lesson is immutability, why, why it's useful, uh, why, why you want to move away from databases with shared mutable state and, and having multiple components writing to different columns in the same row, and, and, and the, the use of an append-only store and uh, read-time reconciliation of the data gives you a lot of flexibility how you want to merge, how you want to create views, and it also allows you to scale really well. Thinking in terms of data flows instead of MapReduce, 
uh, uh, please use cascading and scalding. If, if you are already using raw ha MapReduce APIs, it will definitely make your life easier. And it also gives you a very natural way to think of your data in terms of forking, joining, and, and so on. Finally, monoids and monoids offer like very good abstractions uh, on, on the, the common operations that you do. So it, it establishes a, 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 like a vocabulary within your company about, okay, can I represent this as a monoid or you know, how, do, how do I do this, how do I um, sequence this as a monoid and things like that. So that, that really helps uh, in, in having a good clean code and uh, sharing stuff across teams. So that's about it.